Welcome to the Movie Zone. Today we are recapping the 1963 war action film, The Great Escape. Imprisoned during World War II in a German POW camp, a group of Allied soldiers are intent on breaking out, not only to escape, but also to draw Nazi forces away from battle to search for fugitives. As usual, spoilers ahead, so be ready. Let's begin. During the Second World War, the German soldiers have gotten great success in the preliminary phases of the war, defeating the British forces on several fronts as well as taking over the French nation. Naturally, the number of POWs gathered by the German forces is high, and the number of attempted escapes is very high as well. In the year 1943, in order to stop the number of escape attempts, the Germans have built a special prison camp designed to house their most troublesome prisoners of war, the ones who make repeated escape attempts. Freshly arriving at this new camp are the many British POWs who have attempted as many as 15 prison escape attempts. While they have succeeded to escape, and now they are brought to this high-security prison camp, the prisoners get off the trucks and head straight into the camp surrounded all around by barbed wire fences and multiple towers. There are German soldiers constantly surveying the area at all times. The ranking officer among the POWs, Captain Ramsey, is the only one who goes to meet with the German commandment of the camp, Colonel von Luger. The colonel seems well-versed with prisoners who attempt to escape, so he clearly explains his agenda while they are there. Luger assures him that an escape is impossible, and it would be in everyone's best interest if they would all accept their situation, settle down, and sit out the remainder of the war. Ramsey, however, has a moral dubious argument. He counterpoints it being the duty of the prisoners to try and escape the premises and give as much trouble to the enemy as they can. He knows the Germans would do the same in their situation. Outside, the soldiers arriving at the camp are already planning their escape. One of the American prisoners, Captain Hiltz, scans the area and locates a point between two of the farthest watchtowers. He realizes this point to be the blind spot, and to test his theory out, he gets out his baseball. Hiltz casually tosses his ever-present baseball toward the fence in order to test the Germans. His theory is correct. The watchtowers cannot notice him, but unfortunately, the walking soldiers still can, and stepping over the warning wire gets a few machine gun bullets fired at his feet. A warning, escaping this camp won't be as easy as before. While Hiltz has had his shenanigans, several of the other soldiers try their hand at escaping as well. Several of them, including a man named Ives, hide under the trucks filled with grass. While the two disguise themselves as the Russian prisoners, who apparently never try to escape, so are allowed to go out of the camp to gather wood. The camp, however, proves to be as effective as it is claimed to be, as all the prisoners attempting to escape are found within seconds. The propagators of the two incidents, Hiltz and Ives, are sent to an isolation cell called the Cooler. After all of the earlier prisoners have now settled down into the camp, a few hours later, the men from the SS bring an infamous British soldier named Roger Bartlett to the camp. Barrett is famous for attempting to escape the Germans over 16 times now and even has a cool nickname, Big X, given to him by the other British soldiers. This time, the officers are not keen to let the same thing happen. The SS officer promises Bartlett that he will be shot if he is caught escaping again and then leaves. The Germans might think that they have all the prisoners they want right below their noses, but what they do not realize is that by putting all their problem prisoners in one camp, they have unwittingly created a fine escape team. That very night, Bartlett calls up a meeting between all of the British and American prisoners at the camp and expresses his will to escape the camp as fast as they can. In the meeting, they realize the POWs have considerable experience in tunneling, tailoring, forgery, and many other skills. After analyzing the task force with him, Bartlett lays out the plans. They would dig three tunnels from three different houses inside the camp. If either one of them failed, they would still have the other two. More importantly, he is planning to escape all 250 prisoners out of the camp. Bartlett quickly organizes everyone into teams and gets them all to work. Danny and Willie, among others, are tasked with digging and begin with immediate effect. Lieutenant Henley begins to gather the materials needed to make everything work for an audacious escape by up to 250 prisoners, far more than had ever escaped at once before. After a couple of weeks in the cooler, Hiltz and Ives develop quite a relationship. 
so as soon as they are released, they are already planning their next escape. Before going on another mission, Hiltz goes ahead and meets with the others. He explains his plans of escaping that night with Ives through the same blind spot he discovered earlier. An idea that is so simple, it just might work. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. And Ives and Hiltz are caught and thrown into the cooler again. Meanwhile, other prisoners are working on the main escape attempt. Lieutenant Colin is the forger of the group and works on fake ID papers, while the Aussie, Sedgwick, creates amazing tools from scrap metal scavenged around the camp. The digging is also going on as planned, but there is one small issue. The soil from the digging is black and dark and growing in large quantities. If they do not dispose of the soil soon, they will be found. Fortunately, Lieutenant Eric Ashley Pitt comes up with a very easy sock tool which can be used to dispose of the soil. As for mixing soil on the outside dirt, some establish gardens where dirt may be scattered, while others execute fake marches just for scattering the soil all around the camp and away from suspicion. The entire camp works together to help provide as much distraction as possible for the tunnel digging. They march, sing, and otherwise make noise to drown out the sounds made by the men making equipment and digging. Many men act as lookouts, passing signals while the guards approach so that the men working have plenty of time to shut down their operations without being noticed. Others stage diversions to distract the Germans so that tools and other items may be stolen. One day, Lieutenant Hendley comes across a naive German soldier named Werner, who by the looks of it is no shape or mentality to be in the army. Hendley tempts Werner into sharing coffee and chocolate with him and takes the opportunity to steal Werner's wallet. Hendley knows that Werner cannot report him, since doing so would be like admitting to socializing with prisoners, Werner would probably be sent to the Eastern Front if he was caught. Werner's wallet happens to contain, among other items, Werner's identity card, military paperwork, permission letter to be on government property, all items that the forgers need for their work. Henley is also able to use the stolen wallet as leverage and acquire a camera for Colin. The tunnels get a few feet longer every day, Despite the stress and repeated German inspections, the plan was working. After several days in the cooler, Hiltz is released once again and he goes up to meet with Bartlett to let them know of his intentions to escape yet again. This time, however, Bartlett and the other higher-ups intervene. They ask of him a favor. Bartlett tells Hiltz that the men working on the main escape plan still knows little of the local geography and asks Hiltz to help by making maps of the area around the camp when he escapes, also getting information about the schedules at the nearest train stations even if it means being caught and returned to the cooler. Hilt, however, feels that the plan of escaping with 200 men is outrageous and promptly denies the request. He plans to escape on the 4th of July. The digging in each of the tunnels continues, while Hilt and the other American soldiers begin to distill alcohol from potatoes grown in the gardens. On the 4th of July, they surprise everyone with gallons of moonshine. While the entire camp full of prisoners enjoys the party, the German guards discover the first tunnel during a routine inspection that day. At the height of their celebration, the men are suddenly crushed to learn that their greatest hope of escape is now gone. Ives, who had been slowly losing hope, finally cracks and charges the fence, only to be shot and killed. Hiltz, having seen his friend gunned down, changes his mind and decides to help Bartlett by making the maps he needs. He escapes at the blind spot he saw at the beginning and turns himself in the next day. Though he's sent to the cooler again, he has the information that Bartlett needed. Word continues on the second tunnel at a frantic pace. The men practice their assumed identities and they're German. As the days close in, several issues suddenly start to arise. Colin turns out to be severely myopic and needs the help of a person to even move from one place to another. He cannot see more than a few inches from his face. He tries to hide his disability from the others, but he does not fool anyone. Bartlett even suggests leaving him behind, but Handley volunteers to take care of his friend. On the other hand, the main tunnel digger Danny admits to his friend Willie of his fear of closed spaces. For so long he had been digging the tunnel, but he could take the fear no longer. The man tries to attempt a wild escape through the fences, but thankfully, Willie talks him out of it, promising to stay with Danny all the way during the escape. By the time Hiltz is released again, the main group is nearly ready. 
That night is the night of the escape. In the tunnels, Hiltz digs the last few feet up to the surface at the end of the tunnel and cautiously pokes his head out. But he finds they've miscalculated. They're 20 feet short of the woods, and now they must try to sneak across open ground without being seen. The plan is as risky as it sounds, but all the plans and permits that they have forged over the long period bear the next day's date, which is why it cannot be cancelled. They have to take the risk. Hilt sets up a rope signal from the woods, and men start to enter the tunnel. Carefully timing the passes of the guards, men begin to escape into the woods. Luckily, they even have an air raid, and the lights go out allowing several of them to escape unnoticed. However, soon the air raid is over and one of the German soldiers decides to come out of the camp for a smoke. One man stumbles upon exiting the hole, and a guard hears him, though he does not see anything. The next man grows impatient, waiting for the rope signal, which Hiltz cannot give until the guard leaves the area. The man foolishly steps out of the tunnel and is caught by the guard, subsequently foiling the plans for everyone else. Only 76 out of the 200 manages to escape. The escaped prisoners start escaping in all directions. Bartlett and Mac pose as Frenchmen and board a train, and Danny and Willie find a rowboat and begin rowing downriver. Sedgwick, the Australian, steals a bicycle. Hilt strings a wire across a rural road, knocking a German soldier off his motorcycle, which Hilt then steals. Along with the German's uniform, he heads for neutral Switzerland. Escaping the Germans is not so easy, however, as one by one, all of the 76 start getting captured. Bartlett and Mac, still posing as Frenchmen, attempt to board the bus for the next leg of their trip. Mac is tricked when a Gestapo officer addresses him in English, and Mac makes the mistake of replying in English. Blowing their cover, the two are caught. Hiltz tries to force his way into Switzerland with his bike by his side, but it doesn't work and he winds up stuck in thick barbed wires and eventually caught by the Germans. Hendley and Blythe, traveling over land, arrive at an airbase, ambush a guard, and steal a small airplane. Although they are seen doing so, they fly towards Switzerland. Unfortunately, the plane develops mechanical problems before they get there, and the plane crashes. Hendley and Blythe are not seriously injured, but German soldiers arrive on the scene almost immediately. Blythe cannot see them, and they shoot him dead. Hendley is recaptured. Sedgwick, however, manages to come in contact with some resistance soldiers in France and is helped on his way to Spain. Danny and Willie eventually reach a seaport in their rowboat and board a ship bound for Sweden as well. A total of 50 out of the 76 prisoners are caught and brought together. They are all put on the back of a truck supposedly heading back to camp. However, midway through the journey, the soldiers stop the trucks and bring all of them out. They tell them to stretch their legs, but in an act of brutality, the Germans shoot and kill all 50 of them on the spot. Back at the prisoner camp, the Commandant Vaughn announces the deaths of the 50 soldiers who had escaped and the imminent arrival of the 11 captured. The man is then taken away, replaced by another officer, as punishment for the escape happening on his watch. At the same time, Hiltz is returned to the camp, bruised, bloody, but unbowed. He is locked up in his usual room, and the guard hears Hiltz playing with his baseball. What do you think about this movie? Tell us in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe. See you next time.